Hello, my name is Sean, and today we're looking at the Gazelle, which just has been released for DCS 2.0. And uh, this aircraft has been developed by Polychop Simulations, a new developer for DCS. And they have been working on uh, the Gazelle as well as on the BO-105. And I think uh, people have been waiting for this aircraft for quite uh, some time now. And uh, I think Polychop didn't make the wait any easier by releasing quite awesome pictures and videos of their aircraft uh, during development. And yeah, today we can finally access it and play it. It's in early ac access at the moment, but uh, that will not stop us in any way. And yeah, the aircraft itself um, was built by a Eurocopter and used in the French army as well as some other militaries in uh, Europe. And uh, it's used as a light scout helicopter and uh, can also you full f fully fly some other roles, including uh, anti-tank, like this version we have in the simulator is meant to do, as well as troop insertion, and uh, it can also be mounted with other weapons. And uh, for DCS, yes, unfortunately, we only have the anti-tank weapons at the moment, uh, but they said that some other weapons like machine guns or rocket pods will come at a later point. So I guess we're looking forward to that as well. Anyway... And let's uh, get into the cockpit and have a look and uh, get it also started. So here we are inside uh, the Gazelle's cockpit. And as you can see, we're sitting on the right hand side on the pilot seat. And uh, next to us is sitting our trusty co-pilot, which will uh, manage the weapons for us. Maybe not in this flight, but definitely in one of the next flights. And yeah. Uh, let's have a look at the aircraft and uh, see what all the different instruments and switches do. And I suggest we start from the top because that's where one of my favorite features so far starts. And that's uh, this lamp here. And we can turn it on by rotating at the back. And as you can see, it has a red lens. And the cockpit will be illuminated in a nice red shine. However, if you don't like the red light, you can move the lens away. And now the cockpit will be illuminated in a white light. I mean, during the day it has no purpose, I guess, but in the night this is quite useful. And I really like that you can change the colors of the light by moving the lens out and in, in front of the light source. Anyway, continuing forward, we have here the formation light switch, as well as the brightness regulation for the formation lights. And they are on the outside, and as far as I'm aware, they are uh, infrared. So you use them by using your night vision goggles. Then uh, in front of that, we have the rotor brake as well as the fuel lever and uh, some emergency switch, I presume. Uh, it's not labeled though, so I'm not sure. Continuing onwards, we have the uh, ultraviolet lights or infrared lights that will illuminate the cockpits uh, for using the night vision goggles as well as for uh, making the labels and all the reflective uh, color sticking out and we can turn that on without using the battery power because it's directly linked to the battery and uh, don't need to turn on the battery switch and as you can see all the um, all the white uh, markings are illuminating because they're reflective to this light also quite useful during the night I can imagine looking at the further down at the co-pilot side we have the co-pilot's joystick which is mounted to the wall which he can use to fire um, the HOT-3 anti-tank missiles. Then he has another small joystick over here, which he can use to m uh, move the overhead camera that's uh, mounted, uh, we cannot see it, yeah, that's mounted above the co-pilot, and uh, he will get the camera uh, image on his screen. And this allows him to aim at targets and uh, guide missiles towards it. And we will take a look on how that works in a, another video. Anyway, Continuing downwards, um, we have the normal compass up here, which you can use if we lose our other instruments. Then if I zoom in a bit, uh, we have the radar warning receiver over here that allows us to uh, detect enemy radar emissions and also missile launches, uh, but only missiles that use uh, uh, radar guidance. So you won't get any warnings for infrared guided missiles as uh, it is in the real Gazelle. Anyway, below that we have the gyro block, and uh, this will um, uh, control the gyros for the autopilot, which we will see in a minute. Then 
continuing to the right side here, we have the master warning, uh, master warning panel. Below that, we have the standby or backup alternate uh, or altitude or uh, attitude, sorry, uh, attitude indicator. Below that, we have some switches regarding the outside lights as well as the cockpit lights. We'll take a look at that in a moment. Then we have the vertical speed indicator, the altimeter, which where we can set our QNH or our pressure setting. Below that, we have the radio altimeter with a minimum altitude warning, like in the UA or the MI8. Then above that, to the right, we have our primary attitude indicator. Below that, we have our horizontal situation indicator. Both uh, can have inputs from various systems, including the visual armament system, as well as the navigation computer, and also the other sources, like the radio or the ADF. Then below that, we have some instruments regarding the engine. One would be the, sorry, the view is moving a bit wonky. I'll fix track here, sorry. Then below that, we have the um, engine oil temperature. We have the fuel uh, level and we have the volts for the electrical system. And then above that, or if we start from the top, uh, we have the speed indicator ranging from 60 to 300 kilometers per hour. And below that, we have the torque indicator, which is quite a, new for helicopters in DCS, or I mean the UH-1 also has one, but this one is even more directly in front of the pilot because it's quite important. And it has a red light that uh, will start blinking at 95% torque and it will start illuminating at 100% torque. The reason being behind that is if you keep the engine on 100% torque for about 10 seconds, you will uh, start taking damage to the engine or even lose it immediately. So you don't want to overtorque the engine in the gazelle. And that's why they put the instrument directly in front of the cockpit, so that that does not happen. Below that, we have to switch for the, co uh, the, uh, the pilot side wiper. And next to that, we have the source selector for the um, artificial horizon and the horizontal situation indicator. We will take a look at that in a video where we have to use it, which will be uh, at a later point, hopefully. Anyway, continuing downwards, um, down here to the left, in front of the co-pilot, we have more switches regarding the HOT3 anti-tank missiles, also taking a look at that in a later video. Then next to that, we have some switches regarding the radio, where we can set volumes for the pilot and co-pilot, um, standard stuff, usually for aircraft. Then in this right row of switches, we have a couple of things. First off is the Viper for the co-pilot, Next to that, I'm not sure what this switch does, it's not labeled. Um, we will have to look that one up. However, this is the pitot heating. Um, it's necessary in the gazelle, as you will get a master warning light up here, illuminating. Then we have the hydraulical test mode, where you can test the hydraulics. Next to that, we have the master arm switch. And at this point, I guess it's worth mentioning, A is, uh, the A position is off and M is on, and I think A is uh, a red and M is marsh. Or uh, I'm not too sure how pro to pronounce that in French, so I'm very sorry if I uh, mispronounced that, which I probably did. <laughs> anyway, next to that we have the trim switch, and this trim um, uses a, a hat on the joystick where you can trim like in an aircraft. You can roll left, roll right, or trim nose down, nose up. So this is quite similar to trimming in the A10, for example. Next to that, we have a light test switch. We'll take a look at that in a second. Some more lights, also taking a look at those in a second. Then we have the battery switch, the alternator switch, and the generator switch. And below that, we have a couple more switches regarding the fuel system. The left one would be the switch for the auxiliary fuel tank, or the outside fuel tank. I think it's a root tank or something like that in French. And uh, next to that, we have the switch for the auxiliary tank that is mounted in the aircraft. It's a bit weird, but um, basically the main tank only holds about 363 liters of fuel. And uh, once you have burned about 100 liters or until uh, your fuel indicator is reaching this mark, basically vertically here, um, then you can turn this switch on and the auxiliary fuel tank, which is mounted inside the aircraft, will empty into the main fuel tank, um, which gives you a bit more range if you don't carry any missiles. Because if you carry any missiles, you cannot carry 
um, full fuel anyways because the helicopter would be too heavy. Next to that we have the magnetic brake switch, which is a magnetic brake uh, for the... Uh, sorry, I left one out. Take the, uh, t we will talk about that one right now. Um, the magnetic switch uh, basically is also a trimmer, like uh, the trimmer in the UH-1 or the MI-8, where you press a button and all the control forces zero out. And uh, you can use both of the systems uh, parallel to each other uh, or simultaneously to each other. You can trim or make big deflection trims by using the magnetic brake, by pressing down the trimmer button, and then you can do fine adjustments using the head switch. Then the switch I left out here would be the dust collector or dust filter, which can be turned on and off as well. Next to that we have two reset switches for alternator and generator. I think they're not simulated as of now. Below those we have the turbine and rotor RPM, or yeah, rotor RPM indicator. Then we have the clock next to that, quite straightforward. And to the next uh, left of that, we have the pump switch for the fuel pump and the main ignition and starter switch. We will see how that works in a minute. And below that, we have uh, some switches regarding the autopilot. And then down here, we have uh, the navigation computer and switches regarding the navigation. Um, we will make a special video about that one as well because that one is quite difficult to operate or at least a bit more complicated. So we will definitely take a look on how to operate that thing. Then we have some radios and some uh, comms and ADF stuff back down here, uh, down here, as well as some uh, sync Tekken or something like that down here. Not too sure what all this stuff is as of now, but we will definitely figure it out at one point. And then we have the collective as well as the cyclic. And on the collective, we have the landing light operation switches. We can extend the light, the landing light, turn it on and off. And then we have the chef or flare release button under this cover here. And to operate it, you have to open the cover first. So keep that in mind. And on the cyclic, we have the head switch for the trimmer, I think. We have autopilot disconnect or on and off switches. And we have um, switches regarding the Viper. We can do a single run of the Viper. And we have some uh, other autopilot and systems related stuff on that. Um, we will look at how that works once we need it. Anyway, that's about uh, all about the cockpit, I think. Um, I guess we could uh, do the startup now. So uh, let's get started with that. Zooming in, we have the battery switch, which we will need. So the aircraft awakes. Then we also turn on the alternator and the generator switch right now. So we have that ready once the engine reaches RPM. Then down here we will turn on the fuel pump. And from now on we will have to wait about 20 seconds until uh, the next step can be done. And uh, the fuel pump I think is injecting fuel and before we can engage the starter we just have to wait a bit. Anyway, in the meantime we can do a simple lamp test. All the lamp uh, lights uh, up here can be tested by pressing the test button below that. Working fine. Then we can do a main light test by pressing this test button down here, which will test all the lights not covered by this light test. And then we can do the last light test by left clicking on this button here on the torque indicator, illuminating the over torque lamp. And this can be done just to verify that everything is working as it should. And uh, luckily it is, and we I think have spent enough time to now engage the starter by right clicking it. And you can see the green light indicating that the starter is running and the yellow light indicating that the engine has not reached uh, working RPM or idle RPM as of now. So to fix that, first of all we have to remove the rotor brake by moving it forward. And then once we have released the rotor brake we can move forward the fuel lever, allowing fuel to get to the engine. And uh, this should cause the rotor to spin any second now. And here it goes, starts spinning quite fast. And down here on the engine RPM and rotor RPM indicator, you can see that the engine RPM is is about to reach its operation uh, operating point, and the rotor RPM is slowly following. As you can see now, the yellow light uh, went out because the engine has reached operating RPM, and we will just wait for the rotor to reach operating RPM as well. It takes just a couple of seconds. Okay, we're about there now. 
so um, let's turn on the P2T thing, which will extinguish the top warning light here. Then we will also turn on the trim switch and the magnetic brake switch. Then we will continue with turning on all the autopilot related switches, the, those four switches at the bottom here. And then over here we will turn on our, oh, turning in the wrong direction, we will turn our gyro switches to the GM position. I think that's gyromagnetic and that will take about a minute um, to spin up and get ready and once that's done both of those uh, red warning flags turn off. In the meantime we can uh, reset our attitude indicator by left clicking this button down here waiting until it has stabilized then we can uh, enable our radar ultimate switch by um, scrolling the switch down here and then setting our minimum altitude pack to something sensible like 50 meters and then we can also uncage our standby attitude indicator by left clicking the switch down here and then using the scroll wheel to zero it out so it's set nicely okay that's that done and that's all of those systems done just let me rethink if i've got everything and i think i did and yeah this should basically conclude the startup of the gazelle uh, one thing we can do now is also turn on the radar warning receiver just to be ready once we get to mess with enemies anyway this uh, should conclude the startup of the gazelle now uh, i will not take off in this video because uh, i have did, uh, i have done some test flights and uh, i definitely need some more training until i become proficient in the gazelle it just flies uh, flies very different than other aircrafts in or helicopters in DCS because it's so light it's much lighter than the Huey and obviously uh, even lighter than the M8 and yeah so uh, we will take a look at how to fly this thing and what you can do during the flight in later videos once I get myself more experience with the helicopter in the meantime I hope you can try out the start procedure for your own and if not um, the next video should come soon enough, hopefully. And yeah, thank you very much for watching and fly safe. Have a good one and see you another time.